welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure. It's the more people may come in, but the, it's a great pleasure to have you here today. I think we are a very good uh, group of people. It would allow us to, to have interesting discussions today. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, to use it um, as a brief presentation for the workshop today. Um, so it's our great pleasure to have you um, uh, for our meet and greet of the uh, socio-ecological land systems of Latin America working group of the uh, global land uh, program. Um, today we are meeting to discuss about land systems insights and socio-ecological land system insights from the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, and it is a great pleasure to have um, Esteban um, Jovaji moder uh, moderating um, the, uh, this workshop today, the, the meet and greet. Um, and about Esteban, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, Esteban. So he, uh, he's an agronomic engineer that graduated from the National University of Buenos Aires, yes. where he also got his master's. Um, but then he did a PhD in biology at Duke University um, in the States. And currently he's working as a senior researcher at uh, Conistat in Argentina. And he's a professor of environmental sciences at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, he is a national reference on hyd um, eco hydrological and remote sensing studies. And his interests include how plants modify the abiotic world, the groundwater ecosystems, um, and the rules dictating how humans control ecosystem processes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give you a very brief also overview. Give me a second. Uh, of the set, oops, of the set of the structure of today, uh, we will uh, listen to Esteban for some minutes, where he will introduce some some questions that hopefully will trigger our discussions. We will split split into breakout rooms uh, where we will discuss these questions, and we will be coming back to to report um, on on what we found out. We will take a small break and then we will sp split again into discussing further these questions. Um, or if we find new topics, we can um, do it very dynamically and, and gather around new topics to discuss. And we will come back to report uh, our findings and further discussions. And we will wrap um, this up. Um, it would be, um, and before I continue, I think Lucia, I should pass you the work since you wanted to also introduce some um, sections of this uh, meeting greet. Yeah. Thank you, Maria, and hello, everybody. Welcome to this meet and greet organized by the Social Ecological Land System uh, of Latin America Working Group. And we are really pleased to have you all here today. And um, I just wanted to um, say that the whole purpose of this event is basically uh, to get to know each other better. Um, we can talk in a fresh and relaxed environment of topics that are not related with our everyday research. And um, we would love to generate some output like a blog post or something like that, but uh, no pressures at all. Um, the idea here is really, really just to interact. So that said, um, I'll give the word to Esteban, our uh, starring moderator. Thank you. Oh, Let me share my screen. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Can you see it in presentation mode? You probably do. Okay. So first of all, as Maria said, I am an agronomist and I know nothing about pandemics. For the first time, like many of you in my life, I'm thinking about uh, global epidemics, but I do like uh, these unplanned experiments, like the Pinatubo volcano, for example, which in, in this era of uh, atmospheric, uh, really deep atmospheric studies, offer an amazing experiment to understand how the atmosphere of our world responds to a lot of, of aerosols flying around and how the climate system responds to that. Uh, the pandemic the pandemic probably is offering an amazing experiment as well, and uh, making sense of, of that perturbation for 
uh, the study of land systems is something that I'm very curious about. And, and I think it's a privilege to share with you uh, this discussion and, and understand or, or know what you think about this opportunity. Um, we are in a world of fast science, accelerated, uh, 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 accelerating pressures to publish and to come up with novel things right away. And my feeling is that uh, our community is rushing too much to come up with ideas on how the pandemic uh, affect many things. And we need to take our time and, and watch and discuss a lot more. I'm, I'm sort of calling for a slow science, a, so, a slow science approach to this. But we start to think, we need to start to think about this now. So the first question that I would like to, to suggest for today is, is this one of the experiment. How uh, the pandemic, how COVID is allowing us to learn things that we didn't know about the land systems of the world. Then the second question is the other way around. As you have seen from the very early days, there were a lot of opinions on why and how COVID started, and many of them were linked to land systems. So the question is uh, how, how, how much we know about how COVID started, spread, and impacted us uh, regarding land systems. And there's an additional thing there, and it's this growing notion that there is a one health issue in this world and everything is connected and health should be approached from, from multiple angles. We will see a little bit more of that soon. The last question is about ourselves. How us as, as land system scientists are being affected by, by the pandemic and how our science, our everyday work in science is gonna change after this. So just a few uh, flashes of data. This world of amazing real-time data generation is allowing us to, to check things beyond what the media is conveying. And this is flights, flights in red before the pandemic, in blue after the pandemic. This is the subset of commercial flights, passenger flights, not cargo flights. So there's clearly a, a decline during the, the, the first wave of the pandemic, but this is lasting until nowadays. So a lot less people moving around. Second, ships. Uh, this is a very recent paper that came out using the amazing uh, data that we have today on, on, on cargo and fishing ships, all types of, of, of ships. And as you see, some roads, particularly those in the north, are in red. That means that they are declining their traffic. But some roads are in blue with higher traffic particularly the ones that concentrate uh, in the Cape of, of um, in the Cape of uh, South Africa. And this is, this is a very nice uh, example of uh, increasing traffic with the pandemic from the south, from our part of the world in America. As you see, when you select countries, Brazil, for example, is showing a little increase in, in flow, and it's mainly cargo ships. Looking at data again, let's let's look at from the side of consumers. Uh, we are going to, uh, less and less to restaurants, but there's something that's lower than that, and it's how much clothes we buy. I'm wearing the same things for the last year and a half. Many of you are probably doing the same. But there are issues that are going up. And one that really amazes me is not beer and liquor, which I already knew, but it's this one of building materials and some of the the most booming uh, sectors now are gardening uh, companies that sell gardening tools. With Chilo Grau, who is around us now, uh, we were in, in a rural community in the north of Argentina in, in Antofagasta. And something that somebody there told us was that many people went back to their farms during the pandemic. So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind, how the pandemic may affect the link, links of people with the land. And now the other way around, uh, I'm sorry, one more thing. Um, there's another interesting lesson about uh, our land systems with the pandemics, for me at least, and it's uh, regarding the global governance. And for our community, it's very common to think that things like the Paris Agreement or IP, IPBES are organizations that are really powerful and are, are impacting the world. 
And the pandemic is showing that it's not the case for health, in my opinion. The political govern or the governance and the political aspects of the pandemics didn't go through an orchestration pattern, in my opinion. So that leaves me thinking, what if we have a crisis in terms of environmental issues or in terms of, of, of climatic extremes? Well, is the world going to do what we think uh, from IPVS meetings or from IPCC meetings, or is it going to be more like this pandemic? Finally, in the other question, the second question, the other way around, how uh, land systems are affecting the pandemics, there's all sorts of hypotheses around. More and more people are providing opinions. And from the very first day, deforestation was pointed as a very likely cause. I'm not sure, I'm not so sure about that. There's very little evidence as far as I see. Here you have a very complex report of possible feedbacks and interactions by Australian colleagues. Uh, the only thing I want to say is that we should think more about this and perhaps we have something to say from our corner of the world. What we do know is that our world has this balance of living uh, of, of uh, animal beings. This is the biomass of humans, the biomass of livestock, and the biomass of wildlife. Um, the pandemic is pointing towards zoonosis, the disease transmitted by animals more than ever. And there's going to be a lot of reactions to that, not only because of this virus, but because of other viruses. And keeping this in mind is important, particularly for a part of the world like ours, where a lot of what we grow with our crops goes to feed that mountain of livestock. Um, these are just facts that I wanted to share. And I think now we can go to the, to the discussion uh, and, and see what, what you think we should be considering in the, in the case of the three questions. I, I will go back to the questions so you see them again. Sorry. Yeah, that's great. We would like to ask you, um, I will explain a little bit more on the structure of the of the meet and greet, but we would like to ask you, if possible, to rename yourself with the number of the question in front of your name, so the question you are most interested in. Um, that may help us to, to organize now groups or see the interest in the different groups. So if you can please just uh, write, for example, my name, I will write one uh, dot Maria Piquet. Um, if you could do that with your name, that will be great, will be of great help. Um, and Stefan, if you could stop, uh, uh, I hope you have, I need the screen. <laughs> sure, sorry, sorry. If possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, So ahead. there's question one, two, three, and these questions are also in the website of the, um, of the webinar. Maybe, uh, I think I have it here handy. So I can, we can share the link with you. Um, um, fast. Um, Lucia, can you find the link to the, webinar of today so that people can see the questions. Meanwhile, I share my screen. Because I wanted to share with you, um, to give you an overview of um, a tool that we can use uh, to work today, which is a, a, it's a jump board, uh, but I hope I can. I paste the questions in the chat. Is that OK? Perfect, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's fine. Um, that's a bit Maria, while you're doing that, I just want to remind everyone, this is Lauren Hertel. I'm the communications manager for GLP. I'm the person behind the scenes here as Global Land Program. Um, so if you have any trouble, you can text me or send me a chat message here. But just so for those of you who may not know, in order to change your name, you click, you, you visit the list of participants. You can click participants at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That'll pop up and then you find your name in the list, hover over your name click the more button and then under more you'll find the word rename and you can use that thanks thank you lauren yeah very handy um i'll share now so we're going to be using the jamboards of uh, google uh, a jamboard is like a slide in powerpoint but it allows you to do some funny things like this you can change the color of your um of the background you can use uh, posits you can uh, use shapes or write um uh, text in there and we have organized already some jamboards with the name of the of the questions in a short title 
and the question itself. So each group, when whenever we we organize you in breakout rooms to discuss a question, um, you will have the question there in a white Jamboard. Um, then you can use creatively to to help with the discussion within your group. Um, hopefully, I think we will find uh, we will organize small groups, um, so and there is plenty of time to to discuss. So here's the one for question one. There's another one for question two, and another one for question three. And uh, we're pasting the the link to the Jamboards in the chat. Um, welcome back. Everybody, uh, I saw a very lively Jamboard, two Jamboards um, moving around. That was great to see. Um, and it will be good. I guess you discuss or nominated someone that will be speaking up for your group. Um, if not, just choose someone. Uh, for group three, for question three, um, we have Olivia. We can start with that one or with, with question one. Um, and the speaker can share the screen and can share the Jamboard. So, um, Should I go for it? Yes. Okay, let's see. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. All right. Um, all right, so we had a really great discussion uh, revolving around question three, um, which just to, as a reminder is how has COVID, the COVID crisis changed the way in which we work as scientists? Um, and um, we kind of separated them into three main uh, sort of themes that we discussed. The, th the first one being uh, how we work. So um, we, we kind of brainstormed around the ideas of, of, first of all, the isolation and how isolation has changed the way we worked and how we, we coped with it in terms of uh, productivity versus, uh, versus struggles. Um, a lot of questions around around fieldwork. I mean, many of us weren't able to conduct fieldwork or had to conduct fieldwork separately or or differently. Um, uh, questions of you know being stuck between between visas, um, how to share equipment, and in, in times of COVID also came up, um, and and just the question mainly of you know what it means, um, how research has changed for for better or for worse, and, and hopefully keeping the good things and letting go letting go the bad things but many many of the parts that i think many of us enjoy as researchers were were kind of dissolved over the last year in terms of the the connection the sharing the communication the field work um, but then we also had points on you know there were spaces to some people had the space to look at new questions let go of bureaucratic work um, Increased productivity, um, so there were there were positive lessons taken taken away from it. Um, something interesting might have, in terms of lessons, was that maybe um, the ways in which we collect data, for example, um, COVID provided lessons in terms of potentially being able to collect data remotely, uh, although it might take some time to transition to that properly. Um, and and as I said. Uh, taking the, the space to open up uh, and, and explore. Um, and then in terms of gaps and challenges, uh, uh, we brought up the gender gap in productivity, um, but also productivity increases depending the person, depending the situation, um, but also uh, contrasting that to many people that have suffered uh, mental health and, and, and other points of crises throughout the year. Um, so those that duality of uh, of experiences. Um, how am I doing, group? In terms of touching on points, have I missed anything big? I think that's I think that's about it. Maybe one thing that that we didn't really touch on that I think is really interesting in terms of lessons is the remote work and and travel aspect of research uh, conferences and, and defenses and dissertations. That maybe is another point to. To think about in terms of how we're transitioning to doing things differently as scientists. Um, but I think that's it. Very nice. Um, that's the um, group one. Um, would like to share screen. I think we can um, report back, share, and then we can open up a discussion if you agree. Um, but first, let's let's listen to. 
what you discussed in each group. Yeah. So do we have a speaker for group one? We didn't decide on that, but somebody wants to take the word. Go for it, Lucia. I think it should not be me because I'm kind of the organizer. <laughs> I would like okay. I would love to hear somebody else's. I can I can do it if you if nobody volunteers. I have it here. I have our, our jumper here. I'm sharing the screen. I don't know if you can see. Yep. Well, um, several things. Uh, at the beginning, we discuss on what aspects of, of life or a life in different territories was affected. And clearly, in cities, uh, we can divide these, these uh, responses on uh, between what we see in cities what we see in commodity agriculture and in smallholder systems. Uh, in cities, clearly uh, reduction in mobility and consumption, but at the same time, uh, an increasing appreci appreciation of local green areas. Uh, that may be a trend, uh, certainly proposed for Europe, perhaps in other places, and something to look around, uh, to look at. Uh, the, the response of people in cities to, to the lockdown and, and the need for uh, open spaces or green spaces within the cities. Outside the cities, it seems that in places like Argentina, Brazil, Peru, commodity agriculture didn't stop by, with the pandemic. Actually, some, some, uh, some flows are, are going up, continuing the growing trend, and it's a uh, Interesting that a single ship getting blocked in the Suez Canal was more, more important stopping the flow of commodities than the whole pandemic. The system, the global system responded to the pandemic in an effective way, maintaining the flows. Uh, at the same time, something interesting is happening with smallholders. Uh, many people going back to farms, not only what we circumstantially found with Chilo in the Andes of Argentina, but in other places. Eugenio, Eugenio uh, pointed the same thing in Peru. Uh, so something is going on there too. Um, uh, sort of a reversal of a, a very long trend of people going from the smallholder uh, farming landscapes to the cities. Uh, knowing whether that's going to last long or not is an important thing. Um, and then we went into the discussion of uh, governance are, and our role as scientists and the lessons from the pandemic and is uh, some something important that was brought up is the fact that um, a deep lesson is that science was not that trusted or considered by the general public in the case of this crisis and that probably uh, may uh, that may very likely apply, apply to environmental sciences and, and the message that we had to to local societies and local governments. And this uh, proposes a contrast between uh, our local connection with, with policy and society and our global uh, connections through different fora like IPCC or ITVS. Uh, where should we focus? Where is our um, information and our, 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 our work going to be more considered and trusted? And in that sense, the development of uh, more local connections. Uh, Geoff brought the experience with local farmers where developing a link and a trusted relationship uh, really helps to convey information and making it useful. Uh, and perhaps this whole story uh, leaves us thinking about how much effort we put into these global arenas that are highly rewarded for scientists versus more local arenas, which may have a lot more impact in, in the functioning of our system as COVID may be showing. So I'm, I'm very likely missing important pieces. So people in the group, please help me. Um, but um, ah, there was another point that's interesting and it's the remittances um, and, and mi migrant labor in general. Many economies, depend on remittances. Uh, many economies depend on migrant workers. 
doing the work for commodity production or other types of production. And, and that was affected also by, by the pandemic. And it's a, a useful experiment also to see how that connection of work here, workers in the place where they work and back at home sending remittances may affect the, the whole system. So if anybody else has some comments, I will try to add to the Jamboard the, the titles of the different things we discuss. I have a question with the remittances, um, Esteban. I guess you mind in the way that this uh, the, the, there was less labor and therefore less remittances coming to the um, to where they were sent, right? So that was potentially had an impact in the local economy of regions that were far away. Mm -hmm. Is that meant in yeah. that regard? Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the affecting the mobility of the workers through the lockdowns and the, the limitations for traveling is not only affecting tourism, but also migrant work. And that has effects on the working place and home place. The remittances are not flowing back and the workers are not working in the place where they have their jobs. Exactly. We can now open up uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes for discussion. So it's now the moment to, to hear your opinions or questions you may have. Um, we can also try to link um, all the topics <laughs> we have mentioned. I guess if I if I can get started, um, I super interesting the discussion from from group one. Um, I was thinking, and it's I had no clue that there was this migration back towards farms happening, maybe in in Argentina. I know it's the case here for sure. In in Montreal, people are the price of land outside the city has gone up incredibly. So it, it's definitely the case. Um, more widespread than just um, than just in 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 Chaco. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, I've also heard um, reports of uh, more illegal deforestation um, and um, you know potentially because of lack of patrolling from campesinos and indigenous peoples during the lockdown. Potential potentially also because of lack of enforcement in certain places. Um, but it could it provides an interesting contrast potentially if we're talking about the experimental side of, for example, um, uh, reduced uh, regulation and enforcement, um, but also this inflow of people going back to the countryside in terms of what it represents of land control and, and uh, land grabbing. I'm not sure if anyone has any insight on that, but I it might be an interesting thing to think about, you know, this flow of people back to the countryside, while at the same time, you, you still have this process of uh, land use change and land control change along these along these agricultural frontiers. Uh, well, if I may, I'd like to put some information on. Uh, last week, I, I spent on a small place in the rural area of Sao Paulo State, uh, where I had the opportunity to to talk with some local producers and uh, I was wondering if I can if I could get some information to bring up to this to this to this meeting to provide some insight and uh, and one thing that uh, was uh, interesting to me was that um, a lot of people well in Brazil we, we, we see that the unemployment rate uh, is in the in the in the, the peak of the historic data that we have in Brazil and especially uh, given the, the pandemic uh, impact, the COVID impact on labor, on urban areas. And a lot of people is, is being pushed back to rural areas because they are, have no jobs on urban areas and sometimes it's really difficult to keep renting or the, the, their lives in urban areas. So they are, in most cases, coming back to their roots where they used to have uh, family members and su such as in Cunha municipality in San Paulo State where I have been last week. And then, we are seeing some people coming back, but uh, at the same time, uh, different of the remittances that uh, Joe uh, commented uh, before. Uh, in in São Paulo, for example, uh, São Paulo State, uh, we have kind of a 
an age average of rural producers around 55 years old. So in most of the cases, they already have their retirement. So they don't necessarily need remittances from their family members that live in urban areas. So they are still keeping uh, the capacity of buying things, purchase things, but uh, without a very low capacity of producing uh, rural products in their area. And given the inflation because of the, well, the, the, the Brazilian currency was the most the, the evaluated against the dollar uh, during the pandemic. And now the inflation here is, is uh, an unprecedented uh, high. And this is impacting the, the capacity of uh, rural people to purchase things uh, from urban areas such as gas or other uh, industrialized products. So there are a lot of uh, mixed effects, uh, such as uh, Sao Paulo. If you look to Sao Paulo city, there is a kind of a ring uh, around Sao Paulo where you have a, a very great number of rural producers producing uh, hortalices, vegetables to supply the market in Sao Paulo, especially restaurants. And because of the lockdown, a lot of restaurants closed it, and all those producers uh, lost not only money, but they lost the capacity to keep producing after the pandemic. And a lot of people are asking themselves now, what is going to happen, not only to those rural producers that are losing the capacity, but also to the places in the urban areas, such as in Sao Paulo, to absorb or to consume pr products that they will need after the pandemic. Yeah, so it's it, at least in Brazil, it's a mix of effects. So it's been interesting point. Very interesting, Ramon. Thanks for sharing. Bill, I see you unmuted yourself. Yeah, I, I guess I'm curious. Um, we we heard earlier that um, a commodity production doesn't seem to have been too badly affected, um, uh, and exports. Does that mean that the flow of, of inputs has been uh, relatively uninterrupted? Um, you know, we hear a lot about supply chain difficulties and we talked in our, our group about which supply chains seem to have been disrupted and which ones weren't. And I'm curious in the agricultural sector, whether those, those input supply chains in, in the region uh, were, were impacted. Is it, is it mainly a labor issue or are there other uh, issues as well? I was going to comment on more or less in, in that issue. Can I, are you listening? Okay. No, I I want to go back to, to this example of, of commodities in particular in Argentina. Argentina in 2020 had a drop of 10% of the GDP and the revenues for soybean and, and corn increased by something like 30 percent so so basically soybean saved argentina last year and i was trying to to to, to think what, what are the the particular features that made soybean be so resilient to that and well the, the things that come to mind are one no need of labor highly mechanized agriculture where, where the, the, you need a one uh, machine driver to, to keep, I don't know, 100 hectares producing soybean. And it's isolated, so he has no, no risk of, of, of getting any infection in, in this track. Uh, second is a connectivity with the world. I mean, having the capacity to export and, and uh, the, the, the Suez Canal a uh, little small example is, is also informative in that way, but having the, the, the ships traveling around the ocean all around the world was key to maintain the resilience of this system, right? So, uh, and also a very, a very simple, a relatively simple uh, management operation. Uh, large scale mechanized agriculture with inputs that I, I don't know, it seems that they, they they didn't stop coming, the, the, the machinery, the, the, the chemicals, the whole technology basically had no, no big problems because it was a, a very simple system. 
And um, so in this case, in this particular case, resilience was due to globalization, mechanization, and a low diversity system. I have a question to that. Very briefly, you meant the connectivity because there were ships and no planes, for example, in that regard? So oh, that well, I mean, for, for soybean, you, you don't need planes. I mean, you export with, with ships, right? And the, 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 the only emerging problem is the fact that the, the Paraná River is very low. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the shippings out through that main riverway is threatened in some way for, for, for 2021. So, but in any case, it, it, it seems that it didn't made a big, big impact there. I think it's, it's important to um, also keep in mind that um, the, the trade war uh, between China and the United States was very influential on soybean flows. Um, and within the United States, uh, uh, soybeans move by train before they get uh, primarily those to a certain extent by by water um, before they go for export and an enormous amount of soybean goes to to export um, you know that that's you know, the, the the pandemic then came on top of that um, but the efficiency as I said in the q1 system the efficiency of the system Give ri gives rise to its brittleness as well. There are choke points. And um, if we start thinking in terms of things like cyber terrorism, you know, those are things to, uh, it's exactly those choke points that can be uh, problems and lead to um, you know, much larger impacts. I have, a, I have a quick point to that and a question. I think that um, it's super interesting, for example, to think of the, to compare uh, soy, which um, Chilo, you're saying the, the value increased enormously versus milk, for example, in North America that had to be thrown away by the, the thousands and of millions of gallons. Um, and and where, the choke, where the choke points affected those supply chains and the, and the brittleness of it um, relating to COVID. Um, but I'm wondering, does anyone have an, any input on whether or not, so Chilo, you brought up that the, the simpleness, the lack of diversity uh, and the relative simplicity of the, of the for example, the soy uh, production chain in, in Argentina was what saved it. Um, do we know that the opposite applies to diverse complex production systems? Were they more vulnerable during COVID or were they equally as strong, but in a different way? Like before, if I may, before Chilo answers to to Olivia's point, just from a, an analytic perspective, you know, I would to argue that Chilo's example, you know, I, I might say that maybe I don't know. If, I'm not convinced that that's a right example for talking about resilience of the system, because it doesn't seem that that COVID was a perturbation for that system, right? So it it, it it's it's not. That's, there is no change that it's going to affect the system. So it's not, I don't see it relevant or meaningful to say it was resilient or no. We're talking about characteristics, but the, the perturbation really didn't, let's say, touch or interact with the system, right? So yeah, that, that just from an analytic perspective, I, I would like us to be clear about that. Well, we have a quick question, a quick question about what happened with soybeans is the other side of the equation, it's the demand side. We have to ask why the demand for soybean didn't drop in the world, right? Because Brazil and Argentina are exporting soybeans to China and other countries um, because, well, we are producing a lot of soybeans because people are buying them. And we have to look at the other side of the demand and say, well, why? Demand for soybean didn't drop in those countries. I think that's a, a key part of the equation as well. Um, but, uh, well, I would like to answer Julie's question. Well, just keep in mind that, that uh, 
there was a significant reduction in, in soy exports from the U.S. to China, and China is a very big consumer. Um, and that allowed for that much more of that supply to be provided by South America. Uh, let me add one more thing to that, uh, that, that change coming from, from the trade war. Uh, Argentina as soybean protein content is going down, has been going down for a while, probably as a side effect of uh, improving yields. And we are selling now to China soybean that's not getting to the standard of protein content, but we have been uh, forgiven for that in, in the framework of a trade war. So uh, that can change soon. But because of the trade war, we have this benefit of being able to export soybean that shouldn't get accepted in the ports. And that's a, a, a side effect of the trade war. So the trade war was already giving signals before COVID, and perhaps COVID accelerated some of those. So Julio, I, I understand that resilience is not the correct theoretical term for that. I, I will say these features allow to take the opportunity, basically. No? So uh, what, what will be the, the correct term? It's not only resistance. They, they don't only resist it. They just took the opportunity to grow there, to, to explode this, this trade war, for example, or, to the, or, or take advantage of the increased prices and demand, whatever. What, what will be the, the correct? theoretical term for the resilience, resistance, variability, vulnerability theory there? Well, maybe adaptive, right? Insulated, as someone saying in the chat, Bill. I think it's, it's being highly responsive to opportunities. It's, in a way, it's opportunism. I think something about that, the monoculture system, some of the factors that you described as giving it this resilience or adaptivity, um, in part, I mean, the demand for soy, this global supply chain is so large that it kind of doesn't matter where it's coming from for mm -hmm. the demand side, right? And so the opportunity in the moment was ripe for it to be expanding in the Gran Chaco and in Brazil. And part of that had to do with the policy landscape, part of it had to do with how COVID hit when in some of these places. So there's all these other elements of, of kind of where it exploded at that point, the trade wars. Um, but the, there's a kind of permanency to the demand that lends itself to um, promoting this production regardless of where it is. And we obviously saw some pretty perverse effects on for the Amazon landscape because of this. Um, so I think that maybe there's a, uh, yeah, ad adaptivity, resistance, insulation. I think insulation makes sense, but it also, you know, we saw expansion in a lot of places of this soy commodity production um, in places where perhaps it shouldn't be expanding based on both ecological factors and um, potentially socioeconomic impacts down the line and who gets included and excluded from that supply chain. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know if that solves which word we should use, but. This is a great discussion we're having and I feel terrible to um, talk even now. Um, the schedule was that we will go back into breakout rooms, but um, for me, it's so interesting to listen to what we're discussing. We can choose whether we want to continue discussing change topics of discussions, go into breakout rooms, stay in the panel. We can also take a five minute break um, to get some water, go to the toilet and come back. Um, but first we should dis decide uh, whether we want to continue discussing on these lines or new topics or the questions. Um, we have um, 45 minutes left or, or a bit longer, um, but it would be great. Um, Esteban, you were writing land demand. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a brief thing, but, but we are saying that the supply chains are doing fine and actually taking advantage of the opportunity. At the same time, we are saying that a lot of uh, workers are going back to their homeland to 
go back to small holding activities. And that is calling for a conflict. If both in, in the places where these two systems of land use overlap in the same type of land, uh, I'm wondering whether that's happening or not. That's related to the question I had. I think I'm I'm super interested in that dynamic of, of land control and land conflicts, given that there seems to be this migration in uh, back to the well from urban rural, um, and that contradiction of you know reduced enforcement potentially, for example, in Argentina and con la ley de bosque with the forest law. Mm -hmm. um, Laura is pointing at the same, right? With uh, policies enforcement, Guatemala and Honduras, also during pandemic, when everything was um, the control was not so strong. Yeah. So, uh, Maria, we should decide the uh, topics for the next round. Yes, I think we can. Um, um, I think there is a poll ready with three options to continue discussing um, that Lauren prepared uh, with for the breakout rooms. Lauren, sorry, I'm a little bit. OK, yes, perfect. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> so everybody should be seeing a window in your screen um, and you can choose to stay with the discussion, go back to breakout rooms with original questions or go back to breakout rooms with new topics that we will decide, of course. Um, and you can vote now. So let me clarify, stay with discussion is for us to stay in one group. Yes, right? stay as we are now and continue discussing. We can discuss, continue discussing, and we could even all discuss question two. Yes. Um, uh, as well as go back to question three. Uh, you know, I guess yeah. the, you know, okay, thank you. I, I also like that idea. We can also stay um, all together and go back to discuss questions together, definitely. Even as, as we're deciding this, in, in case we go back to breakout rooms, I just wanted to say one thing about question three in my experience. You know, yes, lots of things were disrupted, but one of the things that was apparent um, in my experience in some review panels last year is that uh, the proposal reviewing can be much more efficient and much less costly, both mm -hmm. in terms of money and carbon, if we just stay home and go through things. Yes, you, you miss out on the socialization, but let's save that carbon expenditure for conferences where there's much greater need for, for you know, multiple interactions. Reviewing can be done very efficiently if everybody is online. And maybe this is something that's particular to the US, but I'm sure there's other challenges as well. Yeah, I added that to the sticky notes um, of question three. Very interesting. Um, I think we stay in the big panel. Um, almost everybody would like to stay with the discussion. So as, as we are, and we can, um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but we have most of the people would like to stay in the bigger panel. Um, we can also take a very brief break if you want. Uh, and we continue 40 more minutes. Um, less chance to vote, <laughs> Lauren is saying. Um, staying as one group. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, I'll stop this. Um, perfect. Okay, let's stay in a group. Let's break for three, four minutes. Uh, we can get some water. Uh, we can also write down some topics or wrap up topics uh, that we may have in our head to continue now the discussion afterwards. Um, I have 22 past, let's meet at um, maybe before half. Um, yes, perfect. Yeah. Maria, I'm gonna walk away as well too, but I wanted to ask you first, um, do you need me to do anything? It seems like we don't need a new set of breakout rooms. I think, you know, it's fine. I think we stay in the bigger room and we will see what we keep on. We go with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I'll be back in five minutes, but I can also, if people, if like there's a, because the one thing I worry about with these is that the people who aren't speaking up might have topics that they really want to discuss. So we can also um, let people post 
topics in the chat and then I can create a poll very quickly on the fly and let people vote on topics, but that might feel too stilted as well if the discussion is free flowing. So I'll, I'll leave that yeah. completely up to you, but I'll be back will, in five minutes to do that. I will suggest that people can write down topics in the chat and Lucia and me, we can keep an eye on that and try to bring them into the discussion. Uh, the yeah, that's illicit, great. Uh, there's one topic on illicit uh, production that will be great to, to pick up. But please also, break. should we make a should we make a jump for this final uh, situation? <laughs> One yes. group situation. It goes uh, so fast. I was trying to make notes. Um, yeah. Good idea. I can make it, uh, Lucia. Yeah, Thanks. and that and everybody can look at the same Jamboard. That would be great. Yeah, I prepare it. Yeah, that would also be an easy way to ask for volunteers for your blog later if people can put their names next to pieces, and then you've Very got commitments good. in writing. Very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Signed. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Great. All right. I'll be right back. Okay. Me too. Okay. How do I call it, Lucia? Um, final jam? No, final. <laughs> uh, wrapping up? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Wrap. Yeah. Final. New item. jam. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate pa jam. Pa panel jam, I call it. Panel jam. Okay. And so the discussion uh, is going nice. Very nice, very, very fast. Um, trying to make notes. Um, it's great. <laughs> Olivia has a, a monkey. <laughs> Who has Anima. a monkey? <laughs> <laughs> we could not see yes. the head, only the tail <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> Bueno, vuelvo en un segundo. Sí, sí, tranquila. Qué cosa tan bonita. Oli, tenemos tu postal ahí en la puerta de la casa. Sí. ¿Sí? <risa> fue, fue edición, fue edición COVID, la chiqui. Tip, típico, bueno, ¿no? Mía, mira, 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 también edición COVID, Estefan. <risa> qué linda. Oh, qué bonito. Ojo. Fuerza. Tiene un ojito solo. Oh. Oh. Nosotros teníamos un asiento Tucumán también, con solo un ojito. María, ¿tenés, tenés noticias de, la, de los perros? De, de... Están súper bien. ¿Sí? El, sí, el, sí. Siguen todos por allí y todo súper bien. Sigue ah. caro cuidándolo. O sea que sí. Ah. Voy a poner, um, Lauren suggested to, um, uh, to make an, a, a common Jamboard now for, the, um, for this final discussion and then mm -hmm. everybody can start writing. Um, for me, it's, I don't have enough time to write down uh, all the ideas. It's great, I think, what we're discussing. So interesting. Um, so I'm going to share a link and I call it Panel Jamboard. And that's the um, can you see can you try and see if you can access it the jamboard the one i pasted so i created um a, a common new jamboard that we can use now for this final discussion um and then everybody can paste ideas and write your name next to the idea if you want um um, Maria, I can see, but I can only read it. I cannot uh, uh, edit it. Okay, sorry. Then I, I'll have to change this. Can view, yes. Can edit. Okay, can you try now? Yes, let's see. Yeah. Yes, it's working now. Very good. Yes. Uh, I have a, a comment to your comment about uh, the increased demand for green spaces in urban areas. And I was thinking about here in the United States, uh, especially in the suburbs where people have a lot of 
feedback right. What we saw here was that just uh, shown in one of the slides that was shown in the beginning. There was a huge increase in renovations of backyards and investments and weird stuff. So people were spending a lot of money on construction and just to improve their backyards here in the United States here. We have a lot of backyards. But that's a it would be an interesting comparison to see what are the differences in places where uh, living space is compressed and uh, in suburbs. Interesting. I only caught part of that, Eugenio. Your your mic is is pretty really? again pretty bad. Yeah, maybe maybe get closer to the mic. Seems to be cutting in and out. Do you have like automatic voice detection or something like that? Otherwise, you can try to write your comment, Eugenio, in the chat, and we can read it out loud and we can then um, discuss it. Um, so I created a new Jamboard for now this panel uh, discussion, and you can start using it uh, to add ideas that we already discussed uh, before the break, uh, but also ideas that we, we're going to continue discussing. Um, um, Esteban, you pointed at two potential lines that we were going um, through. Do you want to perhaps just uh, very briefly introduce them before we get back into discussions? Yes, yes, I think there's a, a big one on oh no, the discussion of all these contrasts between uh, the uniform, automatic, global uh, land production and food system, these commodity supply chains, as opposed to the other side of the coin, which is a, a work intensive, smallholder, smallholder agriculture, and what, what COVID is teaching about these two. I think we can, along that line, there's a lot we can do and discuss. There's another one I feel that has to do simultaneously uh, with the effects and lessons of COVID on the way in which we work and the way in which our work connects to global versus local uh, arenas. And they are, I think, connected. We, we may discuss that as well, uh, how much we learn about our influence on the global or local governance and how much we learn about how we like to work in this new world of more virtual connection and less traveling. So we can, I think we can follow the, the, the momentum on the first topic, which we were discussing very actively, and then perhaps save some time to, to close on the, on the second part, which I think is very useful for GLP also because uh, as, as, a, as an institution, an organization, we, 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 we need to know how we are going to work in the future and where to put our energy. And I think it's interesting to get ideas. I would like to get back a topic that Laura mentioned before in the chat, which goes back to um, illicit production. Um, and uh -huh. I found it also very interesting regarding, yes. uh, yeah. So I don't know, Laura, if you want to get back into that. I, yeah, I think it was kind of in the context of um, we see such different changes in, in supply chains or lack of changes in the context of this kind of global economic slash health crisis or health slash economic, I guess it should be. Um, but, it, you know, the areas I work in Central America are fairly well known and well documented as a transit zone for cocaine. And this area has actually seen an increase in intensification in illegal land grabbing and land conversion related to money laundering due to the transit of these drugs. And it's also from the colleagues I have working in Colombia um, in coca production zones um, because of changes in enforcement uh, because of COVID. So things like um, the 
the redeployment of troops from one area to another in that context and a reduction in capacity to do um, patrols and things like that. Um, and kind of this reintroduction of aerial spraying in some cases or the threat of it. Um, you're seeing a, an intensification of coca production in areas that were previously forested. So we're seeing there's still that demand there kind of like with soybeans, but there's a change in an intensification of some of the production and transit activities that are leading to clear land cover and land use changes. Um, and at least in, in the area I work in, in Honduras, we're seeing a very um, clear linkage between the coca transit and illegal road building, which is a really significant issue for about the biosphere reserve through which this illegal road is starting to pass. So that's the context that I'm thinking of this in. And I guess the connection is, is maybe a little bit about different supply chains. And, and for me, I'm really interested in kind of questions of what is illicit and what is not, um, and what that means for then land use. Um, so I, I think that maybe lands on this in a little bit of a way with soy even because a lot of where soy expansion is happening in, in the Amazon is illegal. It shouldn't be expanding there based on the law and yet it is. Um, and part of that has to do with kind of the political context as much as the policy on the ground. But I don't know, those are just some like general thoughts that things that I've been thinking of and, and notice that I, you know, the kind of opportunity presented by crisis for pursuing certain economic activities over others and with, with attendant land use changes uh, and implications. Following on that note, there was a report, um, I think it's Manga Bay or Greenpeace um, that looked at NASA, NASA satellite imagery uh, in the Gran Chaco. Um, and there's these delindes, they're called, or picadas, they're sort of forest demarcations that serve Sometimes they have fences, sometimes they don't, but um, they serve to sort of demarcate a uh, claim of private property. Um, and those have sort of apparently, I haven't looked at the data myself, um, but according to reports that I have on the ground and that, and that those reports from these organizations, that kind of um, illegal deforestation in the form of these strips has also boomed, like exploded in the Gran Chaco. I don't know if anyone has more info on that in terms of, um, support supporting those claims, but that's another thing that I'm really interested in interested in on in the, on the same lines um, because of this change of enforcement um, regulation, uh, maybe this opening for certain activities to kind of uh, take place when they wouldn't have. Um, but this kind of this this rush to control resources in a space and time where things are in flux um, is really really interesting and problematic at the same time. Can I, I'll say one more thing about this, and this kind of goes into some of the extraction and mining sector, but at least at the beginning of the pandemic, there were a series of laws um, proposed and in some cases passed in Andean countries around making um, extraction and mining and oil and gas extraction easier because of the expected impacts on uh, the economy of COVID. And so this, the kind of soybean example being what so saved the GDP or saved the economic outcomes of Argentina, we have this kind of intensification of extraction, intensification of certain types of agriculture um, as a policy imperative in order to avert economic crisis in the context of COVID. And yet that has then potential, it's potentially sets up other types of crises down the line. Uh, ecological or social. Um, so the kind of what kinds of economic activities intensify either legally or illegally in, in this context and what are the implications for land use. I think kind of COVID and, and the resource rush following on what Olivia said is an interesting, uh, interesting way to think about it perhaps. And I'm very new to this group and just kind of thinking out loud because it's been a really rich and interesting discussion. So thanks for letting me interject. Maybe another way to, um, to think about these issues is the, the classic sort of uh, intensification versus extensification uh, dichotomy. 
and it sounds like there we have some examples of extensification of uh, commodity production into frontiers and maybe some other places and then in other areas we have intensification of backyards and uh, farms uh, with returning labor um, that's that's a, a, a very simplistic way to think about land use change but these are really complex uh, uh, processes and, and maybe that uh, can help us um, frame it a bit. Yeah, I like this, uh, this point, Bill. Although it is a simplified vision of the system, I think it points to, to, to a clear divide in their reactions to COVID. The people that sink to the system, into the urban system safely there, pulling from the thread of commodities and the people that's falling out of those systems and trying to find their place in this world outside the, the urban connected economy. This divide, I think, is, is showing up now in this crisis. And, and it's a very interesting one to follow in our continent, particularly a very important one. We, we tend to very simplistically think of intensification as generally good because it's using less land and extensification is generally bad because it's taking away from nature. But we all know that it's, it's not that, either in an environmental or in a social way. And there will always be um, uh, positive and negative impacts either way. So it, it doesn't need to be simplistic. Great. So one observation, can you hear me now better? Perfect. <laughs> I switched computers. Uh, it, this topic reminds me and brings back to what Esteban showed in the beginning, um, that slide about COVID being a, an experiment, but it's a complicated experiment because not everything uh, remains equal, right? So in the case of many countries, as Olivia and Laura was talk were talking about in Brazil that I know very well, uh, the uh, politics changed in the past few years. So it's, not, it's really hard to disentangle what's COVID and what's politics and what's policy. Um, but that's something, uh, uh, an interesting framework to be aware of. Uh, once we start thinking about quantifying cause and establishing cause and effect. But they might, that's super interesting that they might be related too, right? I mean, COVID might have been an incentivizer for changes in politics and policy, which is also itself, I think, very interesting in terms of that cause and effect cycle? Uh, well, if I may, to, uh, in, in Brazil, I think that, well, this is very clear because it's reported on a, on a video from an official meeting with the president and the Minister of Environment uh, last year that the Minister of Environment uh, clearly said, well, let's take the COVID opportunity as a win, let's take the COVID pandemic as a window of opportunity to flexibilize uh, or unregulate environmental legislation. So he, he was clear saying that the COVID was as a window of, of opportunity in that case. So, so yeah, so, so it's, as, in, as uh, Eugenio told, it's difficult to disentangle the, the COVID impacts on Brazilian environmental change or land use change right now, because we have both kind of both major uh, forces as the pandemic per se, but also the the changes in the politics over the last two or three years at least. So it's it's difficult. Yeah, rather than a designed experiment, this experiment of opportunity you know, puts a a shock across the systems, and of course the you know, the impact of that shock and the responses to it are going to be different, but. You know the 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 experiment there is this you know, nearly synchronous shock, uh, and kind of see what the re responses are. Um, it is um, you know like the uh, we uh, mentioned earlier the you know the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
another big event. Uh, and, and very few really uh, events happen so quickly. Um, you know, the, the global recession in the 30s, um, you know, though you know, much more difficult to, to track uh, in many parts of the world. Certainly, you, we can see um, the, the widespread impact of the 2008-2009 global recession uh, across uh, countries. Um, th you know, there's relatively few of these. Maybe the, the Arab oil embargo in the, the early 70s um, also had a, a you know, widespread shock. You know, the question then is, and what can we learn from land systems, you know, about land systems, uh, whether it's resistance or resilience or, um, you know, movement of labor in the United States. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, highly mechanized commodity production, but dairy production relies uh, to an enormous degree on uh, on migrants from Central America, um, also from Mexico, but increasingly the, the Mexicans are have work permits and they're the the um, the managers, the, the overseers of uh, of undocumented workers, uh, and there has been an explosion in in the Great Plains of uh, of dairy production over the past uh, fifteen years. How does that get impacted? Because those people are setting remittances. How many of them are returning? Can they return? I'm, I'm curious whether the, the big hit that the US meat processing system took has been experienced elsewhere in the world. The fact that the workers are in such close proximity to each other in those uh, conditions that seem to foster uh, infection, is that something that has been experienced in uh, other parts of the world? Don't everybody speak at once. <laughs> aren't aren't, aren't um, uh, meat exports also a big part of, of uh, Brazil's economy? Hasn't that been a growing sector of actually exporting meat rather than the soy? Well, well uh, Bill, uh, there, there is a recent paper in PNIS uh, from a group from uh, published in 2020, talking about the dynamics of beef uh, exports in Brazil. And it, it is growing, but uh, it's, it still represents kind of 20% of the Brazilian mm -hmm. beef production. So it is important, it's growing, but um, it's the, the, the major of the beef production is still stays uh, into the domestic markets in Brazil. But uh, I, I don't know if uh, how uh, the pandemic, after, I, I know that there, there are some places in Mato Grosso where there are some large, uh, plans of uh, industrial plants to process beef that they were that they had some some setbacks but uh, in Brazil this kind of uh, this break of uh, uh, strong policies are even in industrial terms is kind of more easy to to do or the flexibilization at the state level is higher and we we didn't have we didn't have the we didn't have the federal level putting in stronger policies so letting the states to take their decisions and industries as well so the heat as you mentioned in us was not the same in brazil because they keep it working uh, in more regular basis in in this kind of in industries over the last uh, 30 years the growth of uh, grain exports was so much larger than meat exportation. We see in the order of 5-10%, depending how you measure it, versus almost a, a, a doubling of the grain exports. 5-10% uh, for, for uh, animal products. But what is interesting is another um, uh, pandemic, which is the pandemic of pork, the African disease that was really hit really hard China. And that changed something qualitatively. And he said, for the first time, China is looking for uh, pork production, outsourcing their pork production. And there's a lot of uh, pressure to 
invest in, in countries like Argentina, where you have cheap grain to produce uh, pork that will get exported directly there. And again, this is bringing uh, a lot of questions about uh, the One Health issue and, and the risk of, of local pandemics. And, and the, the COVID process is actually, in my, field, my view, uh, playing against that trend because there's more awareness about the, the risk of having high animal concentrations uh, like, like those that are planned for, for this type of supply chain of, of pork to, to Asia. Who knows? On the other hand, prime beef production will get more and more rewards probably in the future, and some countries are putting all their efforts into that, like Uruguay, maintaining a niche of grass-fed beef that will get an extra uh, price in the future. So far, grains are leading and will keep leading for a long time. As Chilo said, they are saving, let's say, the economy of some of the countries here. <laughs> Laura is saying related to that, that uh, it, can it be because it's the control of the meat supply demand is increasingly globalized and centralized rather than mm -hmm. exports raised that much? It also plays a role, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, owns all, you know, so much of the meat production, just all of the chain of it in Brazil, but also increasingly in the US. So like mm -hmm. when they get ransomware, it disrupts the entire global meat supply chain, even if mm -hmm. what the actual consumption patterns are, are more domestic. domestic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, I guess that's another way to also ask questions about you know, can we really think of it as, as, as a Brazilian company, for example, given the, how landed they are in so many different places and, and that globalized ownership of so much of some of these supply chains. Um, I think palm oil as well, we see that, mm -hmm. you know, they're still smallholder farmers, but the way that the actual product is owned is, you know, Nestle or, you know, Johnson & Johnson. Can I really last word? I, I will have to leave in, in two minutes because I have to pick up my daughter from school. So just one last comment I want to make. Uh, many of, of, the, of these impacts, or, or all of them, are related to the, the speed in which things travel around space, right? The pandemic, the money, the soybean, the remittances, the uh, the labor migrants, all move at different speeds, and I think the pandemic, in part, is a, is a nice experiment because it changed the rules in which things spread mm -hmm. through space. Mm -hmm. We have Maria, an expert here on national borders, and. Uh, I think we, we it's too obvious that we tend to forget about it. The role of international borders in defining the spatial dynamics of, of the, the global system. And I think uh, the way in which the pandemic affected that, I think is something to take advantage. And I've been thinking when, when we, we were talking here about, I don't know, what will be the, the in terms of diffusion through the space and mediated by the borders and that uh, sorry i cannot stay more i have to leave <laughs> and thank you very mm -hmm. much for for the for for this session of for all of you thanks for joining chilo Bye. Ciao, chilo. <laughs> yeah how the virus affected the membranes of the world which are the borders one of the membranes. The membranes are very selective. They let soybean move through, and they don't let people move through as much as before. Uh, the selectiveness of the membranes is really amazing. And the governance of those membranes is also complicated. Some of them respond to global signals. But for me, at least in the case of the health part and the movement of people, national the governments were really important and much stronger than what I thought before. 
the capacity to enforce that type of movement. Then you have the illicit fluxes that seem to be quite alive and better than before. I think that might actually be another another interesting point related also to to Laura's comment earlier on illicit uh, illicit movement, but sort of this feedback cycle of you know the 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 role that illicit um, activity plays in a time of crisis, um, mm -hmm. and how that and how that self reinforces uh, over time. I think. Um, is super super interesting. I'm not an expert in it in any way in it, but I think that there's something really critical to explore in terms of the role that illicit activity plays in when, when the actual you know uh, legal activity can't can't take place. Um, and maybe we can use that as a first entry point to start detecting the three key topics we have come up uh, uh, through today uh, that we would like to highlight, whether in a blog post or just to share. Now, I think we're coming um, very close to um, our closing time. We have like five minutes left or so. Uh, someone was suggesting it would be great to have some time to, to share and discuss uh, next steps. Whether we know there are all other working groups on the GLP already working on these topics, like the teleconnection group, and potentially linking to them or discussing further topics on that regard with them or in another meeting. Um, so how do you feel? I mean, we have this jam board. Um, I've been trying to take as many notes as I could. Some topics repeated, some not, but um, I would say like if, we would like to write something brief, like in, in the style of a blog post, 500 words. Um, um, how would you relate the main topics we've been discussing, for example? We can, and then we can use that to wrap up, or what do you think, Stefan? I, I, uh, I think we, we all had the implicit fact in mind that uh, there was a, the biggest disruption was on people's mobility. And for me, it was very interesting, all this um, discussion that we have moving from cities first, then to commodity supply chains, and then to small hoarder agriculture, as well as uh, work intensive agriculture and the movement of workers. Um, one way to frame all this discussion is on the um, differential disruption that the crisis had on people versus material staff movement around the world and how that is impacting particularly the land and the societies of the American continent. For me, that's that's interesting. Perhaps the groups like the teleconnections groups will focus more on the flow of things. For us, the flow of things and people is important to understand what happens in, in the territory of the cities, of the farming lands. So that perspective, I think, is something we can uh, refine with all the discussion here uh, as a group, and can be also the gate to open a discussion in a next step with a te teleconnection group, which would certainly help us a lot to discuss this membrane problem, uh, differential potentials. Um, another little bit of uh, attention needs to get devoted to the, uh, to the community work and the uh, analysis of how COVID affected our own activities. Uh, for me, something that emerges is that we had this old illusion that we could be everywhere, uh, being part of a small and influential community that works at a very global level, and that illusion is kind of broken now, but a new opportunity emerges. We may stay at home and having meetings like this one that I didn't expect to have two years ago at all. Uh, how can we be more open to these opportunities? And, and take advantage in GLP for next moves. Let, let me just suggest that the blog, blog post be more of a plea for, this is a really interesting topic for working groups to, to consider. Um, you know, certainly the remittances and, and land change working group, which I am part of, uh, is, is working on uh, these sorts of things as well. Um, and 
I think it's important to understand that a lot of the consequences of this big systemic shock are going to take a while for us to see mm -hmm. if we're able to see at all. But we can start thinking about how can we monitor for these effects. Uh, so, you know, the blog post could be let's talk about it. <laughs> you know, get other people. Um, yeah, I don't think we need a new working group. We need to. Um, yeah, we don't need to, to fraction our, our attention anymore, but rather getting the people, you know, identifying other people who are interested in, in doing this and doing something like this, again, is convening with a more focus. You know, let's look at these particular, you know, what kind of data do you have to bring to the table? You know, what are the ways that we can, uh, you know, set up monitoring schemes to be able to identify uh, changes that we could attribute back possibly or definitely to, uh, to, to COVID uh, related transformations. Great. Jeff, you said you belong to another working group from the GLP? Yes, it's called Remittance Dynamics and Land Change. It just got started in January. Oh, very nice. And we just had a meeting right before this one. So it's been a marathon of PLP today. That's right. Oh, very interesting. Uh, this is great because uh, it, we, we are also discussing uh, such a possibility with, uh, with the GLP, with the IPO, that several coordination groups come together, GLP groups come together and share um, ideas on interesting topics uh, that we are all not even working on, but that find fascinating, like right now. So um, that would be that would be really good. Yeah. Okay. How about um, it? It was really interesting this last part, and uh, I was thinking about if we write this blog post, and if we know other people is also interested in the topic, maybe we can circulate some very brief survey of. Uh, case uh, people might have data or knowledge of case situations that might fit in one of these categories we're speaking about now. So maybe we can gather some um, information and also people interested in working on these topics within the GLP community and uh, uh, other working group members. Yes, I think it's, it's a good opportunity that we have. We have now three groups that we can merge into this topic, teleconnections, the remittances group, and, and this group it would be excellent. And perhaps sharing some of the topics discussed today, for me, the most interesting part is the questions that are brought by this discussion, more, more specific questions, for example, about the conflicts between these three sides of land users, the illicit, the commodity, and smallholders. Um, and also uh, questions about the strategies of our research, how we get prepared for signals that may take a long time to develop, how we gather data that helps us take the best advantage of this experiment, which is fuzzy and not that simple to analyze. Um, we can share many things, not just the, the very incipient analysis that we can do today, but the way forward to gain knowledge in the coming years. This sounds great. Um, um, would you be happy, Esteban, to sketch something? I'm just yes, taking absolutely. The, absolutely. the lead on yeah. that and ask yeah. you. Um, Writing in English is easier for me than speaking in English. OK. <laughs> I can take my time. <laughs> so I'll, I'll do it, no problem. I like that. Um, and I think there's a, a lot to do and, and a lot to share. Um, so thanks everyone for for being here. Uh, it was great. Um, yeah, we will we will share that with everybody, of course. And the I don't know if someone else wants to very actively contribute with uh, together with Esteban um, to whatever he will be writing, or after he writes it, we can also discuss um, uh, future options on how to continue in touch. Please become also, you can also get be members of this group if you're not. <laughs> now we, we know about your other group, which is great. Um, uh, some of the other 
nice uh, new groups. Um, and thanks everybody for coming. I think we are over now the two hours. Um, so many ideas and great discussions. Um, Geoff also will be willing to contribute to the blog post. Um, this is great. Um, and we will be super happy if a couple of the groups start collaborating and Ramon too. This is really great. Well, we are in touch, uh, write us and we can, uh, and Olivia also. I'm so happy. <laughs> Thanks everybody for, for Thanks. coming today for the really warm uh, discussion and the good atmosphere. Um, and, uh, and hopefully see you again, either in an activity of your group or other activities. Um, thank you. Thank you everyone. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.